I'm Scott Al Miller. It's the 1st of October 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Nicaragua. It's October. That means the leaves are changing, the weather's getting cool, and soon we'll have Halloween. Just kidding. This is Nicaragua. It's always hot. There is no cool weather. The leaves don't change. They fall all of the time. And we don't really celebrate Halloween here. Buenos Dardes. Some people do, but it is pretty minor and most people are not very aware of it and you certainly don't celebrate it the way that we do in the United States but we do have other celebrations here which we showed a few weeks ago that kind of mimic what you're used to as Halloween say in the United States but we're going to get to that and some viewer questions right after the bar. <laughs> into today's topics, I want to touch on a comment that someone made recently. I had the episode where I talked about the rising middle class here in Nicaragua, and someone made the comment that the middle class only exists here because of uh, remissions being sent from the United States, which that refers to is that, as we've talked about on the channel and is very public, uh, very large numbers of Nicaraguans, especially of working age, uh, have immigrated to the United States, taken jobs in theory, so they can work up there and send money down here to Nicaragua. Now, does that occur? Of course it occurs. How much does it occur? Not nearly as much as Americans want you to think. America is desperate to project an image that by going to the United States as an illegal immigrant, that you will be granted a job, being given a lot of money, and be able to not only live decently well, better than you could live in Nicaragua, which is quite a statement in many cases, uh, given how well people are often living here with, you know, even relatively poor people in Nicaragua having many services and benefits that Americans who are making six figures can't afford, um, that they then are sending large amounts of money back to Nicaragua enough to make the rest of their family not just survive, but be middle class while possible and from time to time this must occur it is extremely rare now my cross-section of personal involvement is very small but of all the people i know which is a large number who have moved to the united states from nicaragua none of them have made enough money to be able to send anything significant back to their families at all many are unable to send anything back to their families very few are ever able to recuperate the cost of having gone to the united states in the first place which is often tens of thousands of dollars considering the people will almost always work at or below minimum wage, that they'll still have to pay taxes, that they'll still have many bills in the United States once they are uh, having to pay back that family loan of ten dollars to $50,000. And I know people who've done this and come to me personally for loans of many tens of thousands of dollars. I know families here who have offered to put up long-term family businesses as collateral to be able to get cash loans to allow people to try to go to the United States. That would take if you had no bills whatsoever, if you could take 100% of your paycheck in the United States, one or two or possibly three years to be able to come up with enough money to pay off simply the debt you incurred by going to the United States, let alone sending money back to make someone into middle class. But once you take all the bills, if you think about what it's like living in the US or Canada, living at minimum wage, we talk constantly about how that's not a living wage and people can't afford to survive on it which may not be true, and you can make the argument that if you know what you're doing, you can survive on minimum wage, and that is the idea of it, but it is certainly hard to do making $20,000 a year, for example, 20, 25,000. If that's all you're making, how are you gonna pay rent? How are you gonna buy food? How are you going to pay your taxes? How are you going to do any of the things you need to do? And you probably need a car, and you'll often find that crippling. So typically people who are living anywhere near minimum wage have no ability to save any money to send off to family because their family who is starving somewhere else is probably living better than they are like that's the reality so the majority of people who are coming from nicaragua to the united states are not being given the opportunity to send money back through remittance that's just not reasonable maybe a little bit but it's never 
going to, to, to start to pay off the cost of having gone in the first place. So we're talking about families who are already poor or desperate and becoming more so because they're putting themselves into grave debt, selling long-term family property to come up with the money to pay a coyote, to get someone into the United States, just to find out that the money doesn't exist like they were led to believe. And so the idea of this is generally false. It's not 100% false. There must be people who are doing this. This is extremely rare and certainly not the normal case. Just logically, it doesn't make any sense. If you know what it's like living in America, if you've ever been in America, you know this can't be true. You can't come as an immigrant, make so much money and send money back. Maybe if you're a second generation immigrant and your parents worked really hard to put their kids through university and they got good jobs, they can send money back to the family. But how many of them do that? Not that many, right? It could happen, but it's not the norm by any stretch whatsoever. The reality is most of those immigrants going north end up devastating their families in Nicaragua and becoming trapped financially in the United States with no reasonable way back because they've used all their resources in getting there. On the flip side, if you're here in Nicaragua, while obviously we only know so many people, but it is a small market, we know lots and lots of people who are middle middle upper or upper class here in Nicaragua. And one thing that every single one of them has in common is they don't have family somewhere else sending them money. And in many cases, the Nicaraguan family is sending money to those who are somewhere else to help them get established, right? The money's flowing out of Nicaragua, not in. Not a lot, but a little. For, for the most part, the people who are middle class here are middle class because they have acquired a set of skills, put in the work, and work their way up through a job and employment system system or their family has worked really hard to invest and they managed to own some local businesses that make a lot of sense. And that combination is pretty much universally where the middle class is coming from. The U.S. is desperate, really, really desperate to get people to project this idea that Nicaragua does not have its own economy, that it can't generate jobs. But if you live here and just look around at things, it's really easy to see how easy it is to become middle class if you know what to do and have the resources to do that, right? In important resources are being able to learn English, for example. That's the second time I was bitten while doing the show standing here. It's the problem with wearing sandals. There's so many bugs right now, but things crawl from, I'm on a dirt road and they just crawl into my sandals and bite me. So this narrative really doesn't make sense when you think about it. Uh, one of those resources that you're going to need is being able to speak English. If you speak fluent English and live in Nicaragua, there are endless jobs. Entry-level jobs may not be, make you middle class, but entry-level jobs give you a path to middle class really quickly. The uh, minimum wage here is about $200 per month, and the starter wages for really good English-speaking jobs are around $700 a month, and that's the lowest we've seen. Uh, it's really common to see jobs above $800 a month, and that's working in-country as a normal employee, simply taking an, uh, you know, an ad that you see posted on a telephone pole and saying, I'll, I'll give that a try and making four times the minimum wage. That's the same as four people working minimum wage jobs, but only one person has to go to work. And some of those jobs are even work from home. And that's the lowest wage. If you have any additional skill, you'd be expecting to make more than that. And if you make $700, you are at the very, very top of lower income. Once you hit about $800 per month, you're starting to breach into that middle class. And if you get to 900 or 1000, while you're still on the lower side of middle class, you're into middle class and you have the resources to start putting money away if you wanted to start a side business, if you wanted to do any kind of hustle, if you wanted to help other family members also learn English or also learn a skill or also get access to something or start a business with a family member who's going to do something locally, you really reasonably have the resources to do that. And chances are you have access to other people who can help you do that. Because one of the things that's very different here in Nicaragua is how easy it is to get investment money. And I know that sounds crazy because you say, well, America is the land of investments. Like certainly nowhere is easier to get investment money than the U.S. That is true if you're talking about billions of dollars for giant startup companies that are not very practical. The U.S. is great at throwing money at huge, crazy ideas and, and developing that. But here in Nicaragua, if you want to start a corner store, uh, it's reasonable for normal people to look to maybe start a store, to have an online business, to have a, a, a reasonable kind of business. And of course, in the U.S., you can do those things too. But in the U.S., you almost universally have to do it with cash. Family members don't tend to start you up in a business unless it's your parents. Uh, you don't go to a bank for, for startups like that. Like you have to have a bigger thing and you have to have collateral. You have to have something behind it in most cases. And uh, once you're going to like a startup, you're going to venture capitalists, you have to have something really big. 
So big things, yes, the U.S. is really good at that. Nicaragua, you want to start a big software company with a thousand engineers? No, that's not, you know, no. But if you want to start up a corner store, you want to start some little reasonable business that you or a few of your friends or some family members are going to run, the chances that you're going to be able to find investment for that is very high, partially because there's lots of Nicaraguans and Nicaraguan banks that will do that but also because there are loads of expats either that are here in the country or that people have access to who are willing to invest because the numbers are low in many cases. And so I use this as an example a lot, but if, if a Nicaraguan had a really great idea and wanted to start a business, they could come to any number of people that we know as expats and some people that we know as Nicaraguans and simply say, I have this great business idea. Here's, you know, I'll give you a part of the business. Would you invest in me? And I know lots of people who would seriously consider that. Lots of them. And there aren't that many people coming to them because there's not that much need for it. But if there was, the investments are there. In the United States, I can't say those same things. It's very hard to find people with excess capital and willing to invest in real world businesses. So the world here is very different. And the access to middle class, while the middle class is still small, the middle class is still new, the middle class is still up and coming, it's real and it exists. And it is mostly being driven by the Nicaraguan economy, which when you just walk around, you can see is improved dramatically. And you don't have the same effect that you do. If you go to uh, El Salvador, for example, they're constantly talking about remittance from the United States because there are tons of uh, Salvadorans who live in the United States. They have long-term family connections back and forth, and there are remittances coming into, into El Salvador as a regular thing. But they have a very different relationship with the United States and a very different history there. With Nicaragua, mostly that doesn't exist. And you never hear about it here. You don't walk down the street and see places that do that. I do know of a place that in, in Leon that will do it, but you've never seen an ad for it. You never hear people talk about it. It is a completely different thing. That is not how life works here. So watch out for people saying that because uh, while there can be some truth to it, it is absolutely not how things are working here. And it only takes a little bit of knowledge of either America or Nicaragua for it to be pretty obvious that that can't be how it's happening. Now, if you're coming from, you know, uh, South Africa and don't know anything about the U.S. or about uh, Nicaragua, it's easy to hypothesize that that could be a reasonable thing. But if you're just taking wild guesses and don't know either market, really shouldn't be saying those things. If you have any knowledge of either place, you know that that's just not reasonable while plausible. It's not reasonable. And observation says it's just not true. All right, set of questions for today. The first one is what car manufacturers are more common in Nicaragua? Which ones would be easier to fix and find parts for? This is a great question. Um, and, and when you live here, we talk about this fairly often with every car decision. And boy, is it humid today. I said at the beginning, it's October 1st and it's much cooler because it's October. It is certainly not. This is um, a part of the year where the temperature doesn't really go up, but the humidity is killer because it is on the warm side. We're still in the, the warmer half of the year uh, by just a degree or two but the the constant storms rolling in is just they they lead with this wall of super humid air and we had a light rain earlier today and we can hear the thunder right now i don't know if you'll hear it on the video there's been rolling thunder since before i started and it just is very very humid and so yeah i'm i'm sweating a bit which i apologize for uh can't really be helped and it's not that it's that warm i don't even feel warm it's just it's so humid that there's there's no way not to be sweaty so the big car manufacturers here are definitely at by far number one. I'm just going to start there, right? If you want a car based on reliability that makes sense, if you have the money and you're an expat especially, you want a Toyota. Toyota dominates the market. They are sold more than any other car. Everyone knows how to work on them. And of all the major car makers, they're the most reliable. So you just, you have the fewest problems. And here, reliability in rough conditions is pretty important. Toyota builds for these types of markets, especially. Especially. And so basically everyone who can afford one is going to be in a Toyota unless you have a special case or you have so much money that you can do silly things like we see people who are out with, you know, a BMW or whatever, which are special order and no one can get parts and it's a huge effort. And every time they have to do anything, they have to ship parts in from somewhere like it's terrible. Like I can't imagine wanting to do that. It doesn't matter how much money I have. I wouldn't want to do that. It would be annoying to own a BMW here as much as they're fun to drive and cool to look at. And people go, whoa, you have a BMW? Yeah, they also go, wow, what an idiot, right? Like it just doesn't make any sense. Cost a fortune and just shows that you aren't thinking through how you're getting a car. But 
whatever. So Toyota is number one by far, but you have the two other major Japanese manufacturers are also available and also have such a large volume that you could certainly use them without any problem. That's Nissan and Mazda. So those three dominate the car world and they would be who I would recommend for nearly any car purchase. It would be very rare that I would, I would ever want to purchase someone other than those. All three are highly reliable, very quality vehicles. They're all vehicles that I would want to own if I didn't live in Nicaragua. Not specifically, but when I lived in the US, I bought Nissan, right? That's, I really like those cars. Uh, before that, I had loads of Mazdas. Those two, such good experiences with them over my lifespan. Um, I had the original Mazda Zoom Zoom car, the yellow PR5 from 2000. Uh, Two, I had the Mazda RX-7 convertible 1988, uh, which I kept for 20 years. Uh, I think that's actually correct. Um, I had the Mazda 6, uh, one of the first ones off the line that we had modified and was so nice that they actually put it on the cover of Mazda magazine. Uh, so I've been a Mazda guy for a long time. And, and Nissan as well. Those are cars that I really enjoy. They, they really good maintenance, just zero problems, drive great, handle great, and maintenance just so easy. All three of those, along with Toyota, here are the way to go. I have a Toyota here. I would recommend Toyota as much as I actually kind of feel that Nissan and Mazda are more fun to own. Um, I tend to find them a little bit more comfortable. Toyota is excellent, but they're so easy to get fixed that even if you decide, you know, if you live in, in Managua, you can do quite a bit. If you live in Leon, then, you know, you want to really stick to the major vendors. If you start living in a small village, you're really getting stuck with Toyota, maybe the only thing they have any parts for locally and the knowledge of the cars, right? You're, you're getting into a market where people may be like, I, I only know these three, you know, Corolla and Yaris and and a couple other things, the only things I ever see, right? Um, and so they're very popular with like the taxis uh, because of the low maintenance cost, right? Taxis run all the time. They can't have expensive cars. Beyond those, the other things you see all the time is the Hyundai Kia group. And while I definitely don't consider them in any way whatsoever, whatsoever in the same category as the other three, they are very functional cars. They are lower cost and they are widely available. So you will have no problem getting parts or repairs. I would never buy them. I have driven them in the past. My experiences with them have been horrific uh, as far as handling quality, you know, just just awful vehicles uh, for me personally. So I would never recommend them, um, but a lot of people swear by them. Uh, but from a cost perspective and a, and a parts and a, and a, a repair shop findability perspective, you're good. Um, there's also a few brands of Chinese cars that I don't know that I would get. I think their prices are really good. Um, and I don't know that there's any problem with quality. I've never heard anyone complain, but I really, and this is the biggest thing, right? I don't know anyone who has one. I see them regularly, but I don't know anyone who has one, which kind of tells you how few there are. There's enough that I see them, but not enough that I could ask someone what they think of it. Um, so if you're feeling brave, you get a really great deal. I don't know that I would necessarily avoid them, but you're being a little bit more adventurous. The four manufacturers, if you consider Hyundai and Kia to be the same one, which they are, um, really represent everyone I would put money into because I know who they are and, and I wouldn't buy the Hyundai Kia. So my recommendation is Toyota first, Nissan and Mazda second, really can't go wrong, whether you need a truck, a van, a uh, small car, mid-sized car, whatever, they're gonna meet your needs best, I think. And they are more expensive to purchase than say the Chinese or the Korean options, but they're long. It must be really warm out because the camera overheated way too quickly and now there's serious storm going on. It hasn't started raining yet, but there's a lot of thunder. It just shook the house and this way it's blue, but that way it is seriously gray and it was loud enough that the bird yelled. Anyway, the longevity of the cars is really a big deal. So while you're gonna pay more for those Japanese brands, you're going to get many more years out of the car and generally that's really important here. That's what's going to save you the money. In the long run, so the people who are doing their financial assessments are generally buying those cars. People who are desperately just trying to scrape together enough to buy any car are getting alternatives that are not going to last as long and in the long run aren't as cheap. That's one of the penalties for being poor, unfortunately, is the uh, mechanism sometimes for protecting yourself in the long term aren't available to you and it makes the rich a little bit richer just in general. 
So you can tell people who have been a little bit more successful, who have a little bit more affluence, and who have the ability to do those calculations uh, are choosing cars that are going to be cheaper to operate in the long haul, use uh, cheaper parts and so forth. And that's where the Toyotas really win is that just the overall availability of parts makes every little thing so much cheaper. And there's also things to look at just for general information, as a car owner, uh, the Yaris is really popular here. The Yaris is designed for use around a city. Now, many of you may already know this, but it is designed as a city car or a um, metro car. That means it's designed for starts and stops. It's actually, while it's cheaper to buy, it is more expensive to operate for normal people than a Corolla. The Corolla is larger and more luxurious. It costs more to buy. But once you get it onto the highway, it uses less fuel. And so for normal driving, especially the expats do, rather than taxi drivers, the Corolla is actually normally the cheaper while more luxurious and more spacious choice. So it's it's very rare that an expat would want a Yaris, but if you aren't aware of how cars work and how all the dynamics go into, it, it could be tempting to be like, well, I don't need a Corolla, I'll, I'll save money and go for a Yaris. And that may not be the case. You may be spending extra thinking you're getting something cheaper. All these questions are from the same person who emailed them to me, so I'm not going to show the name because I don't know what their what their tag is. Uh, I have not noticed any of those solar-powered water heaters in your videos. Are they not used? One would think that the climate is ideal for such heaters. What he's referring to are passive heaters. These are the ones that go in your roof. They don't use, they're solar-powered, but they're they're not electric. So, I mean, they could be, but the, the normal ones, the ones he's referring to, they're normally made out of PVC. You paint them black, you just pass some water through them, they heat the water up, and they supply hot water to your house. Yes, from a, if you're gonna have a water heater perspective, they're absolutely fantastic in this climate. The roof of your house is probably hot already and the sunlight hitting it is going to make things really hot. Even in places that are colder climates, you can get unreasonably hot with those, right? You can scald people, you can cause real damage if you're not careful from how hot they'll get from just sunlight. So they work incredibly well, but that's overlooking the fundamental issue. The issue here is not, can we get water heaters? We can heat water without a problem. The issue in Nicaragua is we don't have structures plumbed for hot water. So you can have hot water wherever you want it in the house. We can get inlines, we can get solar, we can get roof, we can get whatever we want to, to make things warmer. The problem is how do we deliver it? All the structures are old, all the structures are concrete. Putting in a second set of plumbing just for hot water is a problem and, and it's something that just isn't going to happen in most cases. Brand new structures, if you're building your own brand new structure and you're in control of the plumbing, absolutely you can put those things in. Most people opt for inlines just because they're simpler to operate and they're, they're more abundant. Because we don't use water heaters at all in the country, there really aren't an abundance of roof ones. Of course you can get them and of course you can build your own. It's a very DIY kind of thing. So that's simple, but uh, overall, it just, it, it doesn't address the problem that we have. So that's why suicide showers are the only thing that reasonably work here. And, and having lived here, it makes sense. Nothing else is reasonably possible, right? All things are available. Nothing else is possible because there's nowhere to send the water. Even the inlines, when we talk about, well, we'll get an inline instead of the, the suicide, because the difference is they're both inline, right? The suicide is at the end of the pipe. So it's everything is in the shower with you. And an inline, the theory is that it's just on the other side of the wall and heating the water just before it comes into your shower. But the problem with that is that you still have to put it on the other side of the wall or in the wall or somewhere, and that's all concrete and you can't get at that plumbing and it doesn't have the wiring and it doesn't have all the, all the things that you need to do the inline aren't there. And so you still have a problem with it. And if you're gonna put it anywhere that's practical, once again, it's right in the shower with you and you've gone right back to where you started except the suicide showers were meant to be in with the water with you. So at least they have a little bit of advantage from that perspective. So overall, there's no simple answer. And, and this is just a general thing, right? There's never gonna be a simple answer. If there was a simple answer, everyone asks the same questions. Everybody's been looking at it. It's just not something that is going to fix it for most people. But can, if the question is, can you get one? Can you have, absolutely, that is an option. It's just you almost never, especially now, you don't see people building their own houses. Right. What you see and people who are building, building their own houses are building really expensive houses. They don't tend to do uh, rooftop cooling because they're either putting in solar anyway and they're just heating it with solar electric wise uh, or they they don't care about the cost. And they're just putting in traditional heaters or whatever. And they're doing something that doesn't require uh, that 
the, the use of passive rooftop is a very Latin American, European thing because they're trying to be conservative uh, ecologically and economically, and they have access to a lot of sunlight. Um, and so that combination makes them really popular and they're, they're great devices. Um, and I've lived lots of places that use them like fantastic, that is what people should be using, except here we're just, most people are doing without right? There's no heat at all. So the average person has no hot water. And those that do have hot water, it's isolated to just places where they put in the suicide showers. Um, and then if you're going to heat for like the sink or something, you'd put an inline under the sink if you're going to do that. Do you suggest any vaccinations to anyone planning to visit Nicaragua? Well, just the normal, right? See your doctor and get the normal vaccinations, your measles, your mumps, your rubella, that stuff. There's no specific things that I would say you need to have um, if you're coming here. The things that we do worry about here and just be aware, everything that we care about here is mosquito-borne. Um, and the ones that are, are predominantly an issue are malaria, very rare um, because they take such precautions about it. But be aware this is in the malaria zone. So you just have to be aware of that dengue uh, and chikungunya are the main things here. Those you don't tend to get shots for. I don't know for which there are shots available. I don't know anyone who's ever gotten them. I don't feel the need to get them. We are not in the yellow fever zone. If you are traveling to some place where you could get yellow fever, which is generally south of Panama, then absolutely get your yellow fever shots. Those are critical. Those are, uh, yellow fever is is practically a death sentence um, and, and it is abundant in the regions that have it and you can go get a shot. Here, it's like super cheap, right? We can go to the Managua and just get the shot. So uh, wherever you are, get the yellow fever shot if you're going to any of those zones, but we're not in the yellow fever zone, so that's not here. We're just generally tropical here. It is raining on me now, and uh, you really don't have to worry about, just, just make sure your normal shots are up to date. You should be fine, um, but you can ask your doctor if there's anything specific going around. However, everyone I know who talks to American doctors tends to get really bad information because they, the they, most American doctors literally don't know where Nicaragua is, don't have access to medical information about it, and just start making up random things. So I know people have gotten a lot of weird advice because they're just dealing with uneducated people in many cases. Um, and so they're like, ah, oh, well, is that Central Africa? Well, we got to look, you know, they're looking up the wrong region of the world and just wildly guessing, which is a terrible thing to do for medicine, but seems to be what a lot of people are doing. And of course, good ones are often just like, well, I don't know, right? So you're left without much. But Nicaragua requires nothing. The U.S. requires nothing if you've been here. And so you're you're really not looking at anything uh, uh, that of significance under normal circumstances. The only time that you would need something is if there was a specific outbreak, and then hopefully uh, both the U.S. and Nicaragua would be issuing warnings about that. If I buy a house and I want to renovate it, is it easy to find skilled tradesmen? Are there such things as renovation permits? If so, how much would it be to obtain such permits without having to bribe left and right? So in general, so first of all, the bribery thing is mostly a rumor from the U.S., and I'm not saying that historically that didn't exist here, but that's not a thing. There's really nothing that you do here where you need to be bribing people. <laughs> uh, that's, the, you know, people like to tell that story because it makes living here sound interesting or it makes moving here sound scary. But in, in real life, that's that's generally not how things work. Um, I certainly don't want to say that it could never happen, that no one's ever had a, a real story about that. And if you're talking about old stories, right, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, yeah, maybe that was normal, um, but, but certainly not now. Cross, you know, cross your T's, dot your I's, do the paperwork the way you're supposed to, and you're not doing that stuff, right? That's that's certainly not the case. So, so first of all, can you renovate? Absolutely. Be aware of a couple major things. There are colonial cities here, specifically Granada and Leon that everybody talks about. Acatal in the north is another, though, like you're not isolated to just those two. These are 500-year-old cities, technically not for another two months. Uh, and they... Um, uh, they have really strict rules about what you can build, how you can renovate, all kinds of things. One of the restaurants that you see on the show all the time, they're a historic building. They have to have crazy amounts of permits just to fix what's there, right? Not changing things, just repair is a big deal. That's if you're going to be in a colonial city in the part that is colonial, you're looking at a lot of permits, a lot of checks and balances, same as you would in the United States if you were living in a living museum, right? There's nothing in the U.S. like a 500-year-old city. So this is a level that the U.S. never experiences uh, because the U.S. just doesn't have this, right? So, so that is something to be aware of. But most people are not going to be living in the Granada or Leon city centers, right? I live in Sutiava. We say Leon, but I live outside. I'm in Sutiava. So out here, I don't have any of that, right? Do I need a permit to build a house? Yes. Is it hard to get? No. 
like it's like just no effort at all if i want to renovate mostly you don't need any paperwork when you do it's really minor and with everything your architect and your lawyer make sure you have them don't try to do things here without them that's just silly um same thing with an accountant like you don't have to have them full time but you need to have them overseeing the things that you do there's so many little tiny things it's easy to make a mistake uh, because you're just not used to what the environment is for making changes just run things but have someone you can run things by specifically for that exact city right because you can ask me and i can be like i've been i've done 100 houses in nicaragua never needed a permit and then you're in a different town and they require a permit like it seems the U.S., right? Every every 10 miles and all the laws change. It's not as dramatic here, but it's still pretty pretty much the case. So everything's localized and you just need to be aware. You have to have a lawyer who's going to tell you those things for you. They're going to file that paperwork for you, right? You're going to say, do I need, I need to do this renovation? They're just going to go, yeah, go, go for it, right? Oh, okay, cool. Or I, oh, okay, we'll go file the permit $5, right? Oh, okay, cool. So generally very easy, but be aware. There's a few places that are colonial, they will pose problems, and there are a few places that are indigenous. You'll know if you're buying one of those, right? Because you don't buy the land, you lease the land. Then it gets really complex as far as building new structures. A lot of things get easier. Like uh, I highly recommend whatever you do, don't have the emotional reaction that you want to avoid leased land. That doesn't make any sense. It's a fully viable way to, to buy houses, but you have to be aware how it affects you. But Americans tend to be very emotional about it and be very, oh, I don't own it, so, but the same thing happens in the U.S. You don't own anything in the U.S. Everything's leased from the government. It's just an indefinite lease rather than a 99-year automatically renewing lease. It's all just terminology, right? So, but those areas do have some very stringent building codes. And if you're going to be in Managua, you want to build over a certain number of stories, you have earthquake codes to build with, that kind of stuff. It does exist. But if you're in a reasonably small area, you're not in a colonial center, you're not in like some specialty land situation. If you're 99.99% .99 of the population, you can pretty much just build anything you want. It's really not a big deal. Skilled tradesmen. So can you find them? Absolutely. Can you find them in abundance? No, you're going to be fighting for them with everyone else. There is a shortage. The U.S. has sucked them up like crazy. They're doing everything they can to encourage them to move to the U.S. where they can wor work them for minimum wage, as we talked about earlier in the video. So there aren't as many as we would like to have here, but there isn't a lot of need for construction. So it's, it's not a terrible thing necessarily, but be aware that yes, you can get them. And yes, it'll be a struggle to maintain them and, and find the one that you like. Uh, it tends to be a little bit of a challenge, but it's just a little bit of a challenge. Everything is a different balance. And, and that's just one of the places where Nicaragua makes you put in a little bit more work rather than just being super easy. But really in the US, do you just automatically find someone who's great? No, in many cases you have to shop around and, and get references and then put in some effort there too as well. So I don't know if it's really that different. Last question, have you ever heard of any gringos who bought property in Nicaragua just to find out later they don't actually own the title and have ownership problems? This one's easy, yes constantly but be careful with how this is worded do we know gringos who thought they bought property and didn't actually buy it yes is it a problem with nicaragua no it is a problem with people giving money to a random third party who is not the owner of the house and or is not the seller of a house however you want to look at that and just took their money um this can happen anywhere right that it has nothing to do with nicaragua's system this has to do with americans coming down and not working with a lawyer or a real lawyer and not checking their paperwork not making sure they get a deed not looking into it and just being like i'm just going to do this myself i just i talk to a guy he's going to sell me stuff what i don't have to go through any processes i don't have to know the local market i don't have to know the laws i don't have to talk to the city and, and file a deed or whatever right so you got those people and then you got the people who are like i'm just going to hire a real estate agent even though we don't don't have real estate agents here yet um, and and I'm just gonna trust that this person who's not representing me is going to take care of everything for me even though I'm heavily 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 financially incentivizing them to take advantage of me in every possible way I'm just gonna trust that they would never do anything wrong both that they would never act in their own interest when handed uh, the keys to the kingdom and that they will be experts in an area that they're not required or expected to be experts in. It's both things, right? You could have the most well-meaning real estate agent who's losing all their money just to do a good job for you, and they don't know the things they need to do because there isn't, there's new laws, but they're not in effect yet. There's no real estate system here in Nicaragua right now. That means 
that those people don't necessarily have training. They don't necessarily know the laws. They might, they could be a lawyer for all you know, they could be an expert for all you know, but you don't know, right? Just because they're an agent in the US, they're responsible for being an agent. If they have an agent license, it guarantees you certain rights and they have certain responsibilities, but here it does not in any way whatsoever yet. And so it, a lot of people have gone with that kind of system. Oh, I, I had an agent, I had a service, I trusted them but they weren't a lawyer. They didn't have a legal responsibility and whether intentional or accidental, they didn't do the paperwork uh, properly or at all. Um, maybe never had the property at all. In some cases, it's just scams, right? Someone's just pretending to sell property to run a scam. And we've heard of that in large numbers. And in others, it's people just don't know how to do the paperwork. And in some cases, it's people really did a sale and took off with the deed. Like we've heard all those horror stories, but they always, always have been with the, the gringo in question did not engage their own lawyer who represented them, who oversaw the process. I've never once, I'm sure it's happened, but I've never once heard even a rumor of a person who went through the proper channels and bought property the way you're supposed to, the way you're expected to, with the, with the legal processes and had any problems with that. That's not a thing. Same in the US, I've never heard of anyone having that problem if they went through the processes they're supposed to in the US. It's only when someone's like, I refuse to talk to anyone, I'm not hiring anyone, I'm not paying anyone, I don't want a lawyer, I can do this myself. And then the person knows they don't have a lawyer and they're like, yeah, we'll just do this. And they know what they're doing and you don't. And they're like, yeah, I'll take your, your $200,000 and I'll just write on this piece of paper that you get this house. And they'll just you know put down the wrong address, it's just not an official paper, whatever, right? Scams are abundant anywhere. Um, and if you, the thing that you, you see here a lot and you have to be aware of is um, when you're in the United States, for example, assuming you're an American or if you're in Canada, you're Canadian, you don't see the scams for foreigners because you're not a foreigner. And so, and unless you're the one running the scam, right? And you don't have this huge number of foreigners per capita. Um, so it's a very different world where uh, you can't really, in any, any easy way, have a high visibility uh, real estate con that people would notice if it's against foreigners. And, and locals, uh, you know, Americans in America for, or whatever, um, tend to know enough about real estate that you know you have to talk to this type of agent and you know there should be a lawyer and you know there should be a deed. And that, like, you just know those things. It's part of growing up in the US, um, even though high school doesn't teach any of that <laughs> and, uh, or how to do your taxes. Um, but when you're in Nicaragua, you have this huge number of Americans or Canadians or whatever that are coming down and are buying property and have no context for what to do in Nicaragua. And they might apply a North American context and be like, well, this is how I would do it in the US, so I'm just gonna do it that way here, which is foolish, right? Because it's not how it works. Or I'm just going to think that they're backwards and have no processes and I don't need to do anything and I don't need to retain a lawyer. I don't have to research anything, I can just do it. Those mentalities come down quite a bit and there's so many foreigners per capita that the ability to run scams against foreigners is one, just way more easy. And two, when we're the ones talking about it as expats, we have that visibility into it because we're on the other side of the table. If we were Nicaraguans moving to the United States, Nicaraguans would have all these stories of Americans who would take advantage of them uh, and, and, you know, try to do deals the way that you would in Nicaragua and take advantage of them in the opposite direction. I'm sure Nicaraguans have those stories going to the United States. It's just that the the immigrants are always the one with those stories because they're the ones in the position of not intrinsically knowing what needs to be done. And so they're very easy to take advantage of. So as long as you're doing the things you should be doing and really common sense will drive it, right? You get a lawyer who represents you and make sure that they take care of you, right? That's that's the process that should not take explanation yet almost no one does it right the most obvious most common sense way to handle something in in any new place right um is that and and so many people want to avoid that scenario for whatever reason that drives a lot of those disasters so um, it's easy very easy to make sure it doesn't apply to you but will you hear those stories from people who thought they could get away without doing the right things? Yeah, all the time.
you're going to hear a lot of them because it, it's a big thing. And uh, and the people it happens to, it just keeps happening over and over again. And the people who are making money on it, it keeps happening over and over again. And one of the things we've said on other videos is because the nature of that scam is that it's international, it is very easy to create a situation where it basically falls under no jurisdiction. When you're doing international business transactions, it's very easy to end up in a no man's land um, where it's extremely difficult to to prosecute or prove something has happened uh, because and, and this is part of the scam right they'll they'll maybe convince you to do part of the transaction in another country and leave it with no legality in Nicaragua for example uh, and then there's no teeth for the Nicaraguan uh, courts to go after you because maybe you didn't do the transaction here and they're like it's not our problem go find where the transaction happened that's that's where your your court case has to happen we have solid rain now i'm going to wrap up with that thanks for joining me like and subscribe if you'd like to support the channel you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash scott allen miller that comes directly to me it's like patreon it's your way of of directly helping me cover the cost of doing this channel i appreciate it so much everyone who has reached out and done that share on social media, post these links wherever you can find, tell friends and family. I know so many of you are, I hear constantly people saying that they're uh, telling people about the show and getting new people. We just have this constant flow of, of new organic subscribers. It's awesome. And so many people on commenting, you have your own questions. Uh, if I haven't answered them yet, even if I have, get down in those comments and ask away. That's where I get the content for a lot of the show. Thanks for joining me. I will see all of you tomorrow.